I uh, think we're going to start off this morning. If you were here Wednesday night, we did a little game together, and it worked out pretty decent. We're not going to do a game, uh, but there's a reason for this. But I'm going to put some pictures of actors up on the screen here in a second, and we're going to kind of do the reverse. On Wednesday, we gave you the uh, young picture of them when they were in high school and see if you could guess who they were. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to give you a picture of an actor when they're older, and I want to see if you know who they are, all right? So there are six of them. So here we go as we go through these. The first one is Jake Lloyd. Just raise your hand if you have a clue who he is. I see one hand. All right, here's who he is. Anakin. Do you remember Anakin? Do you know who he is now? All right, here's the next one. Ari- or Ariana Richards. How many of you recognize her and know her? Nobody. All right, here's who she is. Now, do you know who she is? Do you know who she is? Jurassic Park, the first one, the little girl. All right, that's her. She's never done anything except that movie, but that's her. All right, next one. Jonathan Kwan. How many of you know him? Ah, we've got 16 candles. We've got about seven or eight. All right, now see if you know who he is. Now, do you know who he is? Prayers of the Lost Ark. All right, he's a little guy that runs around. The, was it the Temple of Doom? Where he's riding around like in the little uh, mine cart, like across the tra- tracks and all. Okay, uh, next one up. Ross Bagley. How many of you know who he is? All right, before we get there, who do you think he is? What movie? Who do you think it is, Annie? Wow, thanks. He's a little black boy. He's like saying he's a little white boy. Yeah, there's like 10 of those in every movie. yip de doo what movie? You don't know. See, you put your hands up without confidence. I can't have cheaters like this. Yeah, I think he actually knows. He can't get it out. Okay, here we go. Independence Day. All right? Remember Independence Day? That was Ross. Annie, you're disqualified. All right, next one, Jonathan Lipnicki. How many of you know? Okay, a few more know him. All right, I'm going all the way back. Who did what movie? Jerry Maguire. It is right. Remember, that's him. Okay, the kid from Jerry Maguire. Last one, this is a dual one because they were in a movie together. Amber Scott and Charlie Corsmo. How many of you recognize the two of them? They were in a movie together. Okay, I didn't ask for answers. Okay, anyways, here we go. It was it. All right, they're from Hook, the little kids in Hook. Did you actually know that one? Did you get it right that time? Okay, they're actually little kids from Hook. Um, Today, what we're going to do, we're going to finish up our series on Gideon. So this is, I think, week eight of going through his story. And it's been quite the journey as we have seen his life. And what I want to do for one last time is just put the whole story together for you here of where he's been what has happened in this period of his life? Um, if you remember, what we see is we see this guy being transformed in a very short amount of time from a guy living in fear to a guy who is embracing his purpose of, that God has given him. And where he starts off, if you remember, is he starts off when we first find him with all the rest of the Israelites, scared out of his mind, living in fear, and he's actually living in a hole at that point in his life, and he's hiding out from the Midianites because he is scared to death of them, and he's living in a hole. While he is there and he's getting wheat there, um, an angel of the Lord shows up to him, and the Lord, this angel says to him, mighty hero, you're going to rescue Israel. And he says, God's going to be with you. And for the first time, Gideon goes from this nobody living in a hole to this guy being told by God, by a spokesman for God, that you are a mighty hero, that you're going to do something great. And the first thing we see is after that, God gives him a little task to do, And he tells Gideon, the first thing I need you to do is go to your dad's hometown. They've got these idols there. You need to cut those things down, cut them up, and then you need to put an altar to God there, and you need to burn uh, their stuff to use for this altar of God. And it says Gideon that night, still kind of tentative, still kind of scared, but he does what God asks him to do. But he goes in the middle of the night with 10 other guys, and they do what God's asked him to do, and he takes his first baby steps of faith. We see from there, the people of the town are ticked off. Um, They actually want his head. They want to lynch him, and a lynch mob comes out. His dad saves him, 
But after his dad saves him, the people still kind of taunt him, and they give him that name, which is Baal's going to have his um, revenge on you or whatever. And they're basically waiting for their god to kill Gideon, and they put this nickname on him. From there, the next thing we see is Gideon is still overwhelmed with this task, and he wants to test God, and it's the whole towel thing where he puts the towel out, and he says, God, if this is really what you want me to do, do this, and God does it, and he says, let me test you one more time, and he does this, and God does that for him. And at that point, we see Gideon um, ready to act, and he gets his army, and he collects his army of 32,000 men, and he's going to go up and up against an army of 135,000, all right? And he gets his army of 32,000. God trims that down to 300. And he trims it down. And once he trims it down, he says, Gideon, now you're ready to go to war against this 135,000-man army. You're ready to go. And Gideon at that point still a little hesitant because he's going, before it was 4 to 1 odds. Now it's 450 to 1 odds. I'm a little hesitant. God says, I'll encourage you. Go down to the camp. They go down to the camp. They hear the dream. And the dream confirms for Gideon that God is on his side and that God's going to take care of him. And we see Gideon from that point goes back up and he grabs his 300 and he goes, it's time. We are, we are ready to act. And he gets his 300 men. They go down. They attack the enemy. God works in some ways. The guys attack each other. Gideon has a great victory. He chases after them. All the other people are inspired and they come chasing after him as well. He has a few road bumps um, along that journey where some people reject him. They don't believe in him that we talked about last week. But eventually they have complete, utter victory over the Midianites. Um, and he gets rid of them. And what we have to remember is this. This is very key. All of these events in the story take place within several weeks. Okay? We're looking at most. We've done this series for about eight weeks. It's probably around eight weeks from him living in the hole to this complete victory against many nights. Um, so you're looking about the same time we have traveled for eight weeks. That's how long Gideon went from being this guy living in a hole to a war hero who took 300 guys and defeated this huge, massive military that was occupying them for years, all right? Today, what we're going to look at is the end of a story. And here's how it wraps up. We're going to be in uh, chapter 8 of Judges, starting in verse 22. And here's how the story wraps up. It says this, Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Be our ruler. You and your son and your grandsons will be our ruler, for you have rescued us from Midian. But Gideon replied, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. So the first thing we see is after the great victory, the people go, be our king. Be our ruler. You, your sons, your grandsons, you can rule us because you led us to this great victory. Be our king. And his thing, he shows great humility here. You got to remember, these are the same people just several weeks back are mocking him. And now they're coming to him going, be our king. And he says this. He says, no. I'm not going to be your king. God's your king. God's your Lord. You need to follow God. You don't need to just follow me. And and what you see is you see a guy at this point shows great humility and goes, I need to put all the glory back on God. I need to refocus everyone back to him. And here's one of the keys to learn from that. When you take action for God, when God calls you to a task, he's not calling you to the task for you to bring glory to yourself. He's not calling you to a task so that you can put yourself up on a pedestal and go, look at me. He calls you to a task so that you can call others back to God. And that's what Gideon demonstrates here. And if you look at the other characters of the Old Testament, the New Testament, you will see the story over and over again where people are put in a place where people are willing to praise them. And the good ones go, wait a second, don't praise me, praise God. And we need to remember that as Christians, that we are never here to receive the praise for the things we do in the name of God. We are here to put the praise back on Christ. We are here to put the praise back on God and lead people back to him, not to us. None of our roles is to put ourselves on pedestals and go, look how wonderful we are. Our whole reason of being there is so we can highlight God and go, look how wonderful God is. He needs to be your ruler. He needs to be your king, not me. And Gideon does a good job of that at the beginning. Then it goes on in verse 24. It says, however, I do have one request. So he says, I'm not going to be your king. God will be. He says, I have one request that each of you give me an earring from the plunder that you collected from your fallen enemies. The enemies being Ishmaelites, all wore gold gold earrings. So he's basically going, everybody just give me half of your rewards of what you plundered off of the dead fallen enemies. And they say, gladly, they replied, they spread out a cloak and each one threw in a gold earring he had gathered from the plunder. The weight of the gold earrings weighed 43 pounds. That's not including the royal ornaments or pendants the purple clothing worn by the kings of Midian or the chains around their necks 
of their camels. So he just says, here's the deal. I'm not going to be your king, but if you would each give me half your plunder, they go, absolutely, we'll give you your plunder. They lay a cloak down. They all take off one layer ring. They stick it in there. He gets 43 pounds of gold. He, being a numbers guy, was interested by that. So I was like, 43 pounds of gold, that sounds like something, but Roy, what is that? I took to uh, Friday's uh, what a ounce of gold is worth and then calculated it all out with 43 pounds and all that. Here's how much money he just got in our terms. $743,728. Okay? So he wins this victory, and they basically lay down at his feet $744,000 worth of gold, and they go, here it is, Gideon. And they throw up before him, and he still has some extra side things. So let's round that up to probably close to about $850,000 worth of merchandise or value he gets in his hands. And you see Gideon with the ability to be set for life here now. Uh, so he's had great victory. He has the ability to be set for life. They throw this money before him. He takes it, and here's what it says he does with it. It says in verse 27, Gideon made a sacred ephrod um, from the gold and put it in Ophrah, his hometown. Now, real quick, no one really knows what that is, okay, that he made. Uh, that thing there, the sacred, it's ephid, ephid. A sacred ephid. The word ephid we know was the Jewish priest in the temple actually wore like this garment in the front that had gold woven into it, and that's what an ephid is. But for 43 pounds of it and all, we really don't know what it is because it doesn't make sense with that word. So the scholars don't really know what he made, but we do know the result. So I'm not thinking it was this garment thing. He made maybe a statue of, I don't know, something. He made some type of statue out of this gold. And it says, here's what happened. But soon all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. All right? Now it says they it made, uh, but soon afterwards it says, what is it? Israelites prostitute. What it means by prostitute themselves is this. They started sharing their lives again instead of just with God, with others, with other gods. And basically they started to worship an idol again. And do you remember where they first started just several weeks ago? What were they doing? Worshiping idols. So Gideon, after this great victory, he, he doesn't want to be king. He gets this gold from him, this reward. He makes whatever this thing is, and this thing in a very short amount of time becomes something that Israelites start worshiping as a god in place of the god who just gave them victory. And it even says it becomes a trap for Gideon and his own family. What you see is this. Gideon loses focus really quickly after victory. Um, and he starts the spiritual death spiral that he just rescued all of Israel from just weeks ago. And he starts the whole process again. And I started looking at that, and I was shocked. I was like, how can that be? This guy has all the success. He does all these great things. And his first deed, after having victory and leading everyone back to God and getting rid of the Midianites, is he starts them right back on the same path they were on, and he becomes the guy who creates the thing that leads them the destination that they just escaped from. And I was shocked, but then I started to think about this. Actually, it's pretty typical of our spiritual lives. If you think about it, many times after we have spiritual success, we get comfortable, and when we get comfortable, we allow things back in our lives that caused us the distance we had between us and God originally, and we allow those things to start seeping back into our lives. Do we not? Let me explain how this works. You see this happen in your life all the time. How many of you have had this experience multiple times in your lives? You've had a good moment with God or a good time with God, and you felt really close to him, and then you woke up one day and you realized, man, I've, I've drifted far away from him. And you had this thought, man, I need to get back on track. I need to get things back together. I need to start doing this. How many of you have done that before in your life? Okay, we've all been there. That's Gideon. Gideon has this great moment. He has this time. He's really close to God. He does amazing things with the help of God. As soon as it's over, you kind of get this sense that he gets comfortable. And he allows these things to start seeping back into his life, which were the main root that caused him to walk away from God in the first place and be distant from him. But because he's comfortable, he doesn't even notice it, and he just starts letting it seep back in. And, and this is something we all get ourselves in trouble with. Too often, I think our spiritual lives look a lot like the lives of those actors that I just put up on the screen, which is this. They have one big hit, they have one big moment, and that's all they ever have. And in our spiritual lives, we have one big hit, 
we have one big moment. That's all to the story. That's all there is. It's just, that's it. And we can remember back to that time like 20 years ago when we, we took the step of faith for God. But it's that 20 years ago, and that's the one thing, the one story I keep telling everyone is that same story. So whenever I see people, I tell them that story because I haven't had any new ones in the last 20 years. But I have that one moment that I hang on to and go, see, everything's cool with me because I had that one moment. The movie stars up on that I showed you. You don't know them when they're old. Why? You've never seen them before again. They had a hit when they were kids. You never saw them again. They disappeared. They haven't done more movies. So I show you their adult picture, and you're going, no clue who that person is. I show you the little picture of who they are, and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that movie. Our spiritual lives, we often go, yeah, here's what I did back then. And people go, but that doesn't look like you today. Who are you? Because the story you're telling me doesn't, rec- doesn't match up with who I see today. And you live in the past. And that's not what God ever desired from us. Um, You've got to understand this. If you are not moving forward in your spiritual journey, um, you are actually moving backwards. Um, there is no neutral. There is no place that you just get to play, stay in a place of transition or you just get to coast. If you are not growing spiritually, what naturally happens is this. You start declining. And we discussed this in our Sunday school class several weeks ago. The weird part of it is this. It's very subtle, which is it's not like you reach a peak and then it just crashes. You reach a peak, and then you slowly start to decline. And before you know it, you're not too far off from where you used to be at one point when you were very dissatisfied with your relationship with God. And you find yourself back there again. And yet you can still look at that one point and go, I remember that day. I remember that moment. Um, Some of you, it's as bad as this. You became a Christian. That's the only story you have. I became a Christian. I I had faith in Jesus Christ. I gave my life to him, and that's where it ended. I didn't go anywhere else. And you can go back and you can go, I remember when I became a Christian. Here was the story. I remember what took place the first eight weeks afterwards. And now there's nothing new. And you keep living back there and going, that's not what God intended for your life. That's what Gideon has done. And that's not a good end to the story. Uh, Judges 8, uh, verse 28 carries on. It says this, that is the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, uh, which never recovered. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land. Then Gideon's son of Joash returned home. For 40 years, they have peace. But within that peace, what we also find is this, is they start having a spiritual disintegration amongst themselves. And for 40 years in their peace, they start to erode spiritually. And that's what you will find a lot of times in peace. When you have success and then you find comfort and you're in a peaceful time where things seem to be smooth, what you will notice is your spiritual life start to erode. They start to erode. If you read into chapter 9, past Gideon's life, it gets messy, really messy, really quick after his death. Why? The people are not at the exact same place they were when Gideon first acted, and they have returned to that exact same place. You see, here's the thing. God never expected you just to be a one-hit wonder. Um, God wanted you to be continual warriors for the cause of Christ. That was his desire. He didn't expect you to have one great moment where you went, that is my one huge success moment. He went, I expect you to have a whole list of stories throughout your whole life where you are a warrior for Jesus Christ and you are stepping out on faith and you are acting on faith on a continual basis that never ends because you are always serving God you are always pursuing his kingdom and you are always representing his son, Jesus Christ. And it's a continual thing. It's not a one hit, one time wonder thing. It's a continual process. So what I wanna wrap up today with this is this. I wanna look at four New Testament scriptures that talk about this um, issue we have with getting comfortable, thinking the fight's over and just getting comfortable. And then what happens is our spiritual lives erode. And I want to read to you four scriptures that kind of hit on that. The first one comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's what Paul writes. Paul says this, if you think you are standing strong, be what? Careful not to fall. Kind of interesting. He doesn't say when you're weak, be careful you don't fall again. He says when you think you are standing firm, or how does he say it? When you think you're standing strong or firm, Be careful not to fall. Paul recognized this. We feel like we've made it. When we feel like we've had success, when we feel like our relationship with God is great, 
He's going, that's where most people fall. That's where the downfall begins. We need to be on our guards that, yes, we can take action for God. We can take steps of faith, but we can't just stop there. We can't stop when we have success. We can't stop when we just feel close to God. We have to understand at that point, that's when it's most dangerous for us to fall because we get comfortable and we get laxed and we need to be on our guard. At Galatians 6, 9, Paul writes this. He says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap the harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So Paul here says this, don't get tired of doing good. Um, you've probably all been there before with me. And I've served a lot. I've done these things for the kingdom, and it's time for me to take a step back and just rest. How many of you have done that one? All right? You're going to find this out. After we get through Bethlehem Walk, we're all going to be exhausted, right? If you've been through Bethlehem Walk before, it's exhausting, but it's a great opportunity we have to this community and to this area of town, but it's exhausting. And when we get done, we even schedule in our church schedule like a month of nothing because we just kind of all need to recap or recoup. Um, but the thing we have to be careful of is this. We can't let that extend for six months. Uh, you could go for six months, we just need to do nothing because, man, we did that one big event. We did this big outreach thing at this point. We just need to relax out. No, you don't. You need to recoup a little bit, but you don't need to just stay there then and live on what you did at that point. It is a continual process. Don't ever give up or ever get bored or get tired of doing good. God will present you opportunities all the time, and even if you're tired, you can still do good. Why? Because that's what God's called you to do. Uh, another one from Luke. This is Jesus. He says this. He says, uh, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross. How often? How often? How often? Okay. Every, see, he intentionally put this in there. You need to take up your cross daily. Follow me. Why? He knew who we are. He knew that we have the temptation. If we don't think about it daily and recommit daily, we would get lazy. We would get laxed. We would live on our one hit and be satisfied with it. And Christ is going, you want to be my follower, you need to take up your cross, not once, daily. Every single day, and you need to crucify yourself, and you need to put me first, and my priorities first in your life. Daily, I need you to do this. He's very intentional on that because he knew that we would get laxed. He knew we would get tired. And he's going, every day you need to wake up and make a new commitment to Christ. Not one time in your life when you give your life fully to Christ. Every single day you need to remake that commitment to put it in the forefront of your mind to people here serving, all right, to get that priority right. The last scripture I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians 4, um, Paul goes through a lot of the hardships that he goes through prior to the scripture. A lot of the hardships that he went through, um, he kind of lists those and all, and then he talks about the people he's won to Christ and how satisfying that is. And then he wraps it up with this. He says, that is why we never give up. Never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Paul says, because I see the impact on the people's lives around me, even though I'm going through all this other stuff, having that happen to get to this point, that's why I never give up because I get to see this. And even though my body's tired and my body's wasting away, my spirit's being renewed every single day because I see what God's doing in my life and I see what he's doing in the life of others around me. Uh, that is Paul's uh, command to us is just never give up. It's worth it. It's worth seeing people's lives change. You see, God has called each of us to change the world that we have contact with for his glory. That's what we've been called to do. Each of us in the realms and the lives that we get to touch, we have been called to impact people's lives for the glory of God. So don't ever get comfortable. Don't ever get satisfied. Don't ever get apathetic. And don't ever get lazy like Gideon did. Remember, the fight is never over. Don't ever give up because someone's eternity might depend on you each and every day. And if you get lazy and apathetic and get comfortable, you might miss the moment that God has put there for you to change someone's life for eternity. And that's what life is all about. Pray with me.